Today on Muscle Car, Red Sled has some junk in the trunk. See how it gets worked out. We'll show you how to safely remove lead filler and the Buick that marked the pinnacle of 80s muscle. Welcome to Muscle Car. We're knocking out some trouble spots on a 61 Impala today. Now we've already taken care of a lot of rust spots, but believe me, there's plenty more where that came from. We also need to get all the lead filler out. The last time we got the rear seat pans in, got the quarter panels patched in, and started the body work on the fenders. Now next up is this piece of Swiss cheese here that used to be a weather strip channel. I've heard of guys actually passing up on project cars because of problems just like this. It can be a real pain in the you know what to fix. Because what we've actually got here is three separate pieces. Now this outer piece here, we're going to patch this in and save it. This inner piece is part of the trunk floor, so it's going to get chopped out and replaced with the rest of it. This little channel right here, we're going to custom make that and replace that one piece at a time. After measuring the length and total width of the part, I'll share it to width and make the bends. The shrink or stretcher will help tweak it to the right shape. We need to keep the trunk bump stops, so I'll remove those first. When sheet metal gets this flimsy, it can bend out of shape when you pull it off. So I made the new piece before removing the old one. That way, I'd still be able to compare the two. Now's a good time to repair some of the rust that'll be hard to get at once the channel is put back on. The new channel goes in next. Then I'll drill out the spot welds and get the rest of the old trunk floor out of the way. While I'm packing more junk in the trunk, Brent has his eye on some rust. Now some of these holes are going to have to be patched, but these small ones, well they can be filled with silicon bronze. But before anything can happen, he's grinding it down to bare metal. Silicon bronze has a low melting point, so the steel doesn't melt before the bronze fills the hole. Brent's using a TIG because it's a lot easier to control the heat. Now we've replaced a lot of sheet metal around this trunk, so there's a chance that things aren't going to line up the way that they should. So before we get that rear brace in and get the trunk floor in, we're going to hang the trunk lid and make sure it still lines up. How's your gap? getting a little tight down on the end. So it's perfect over here. We'll, we'll work on this side over here. I think if we come back, push that out, and then knock this out a little bit before we weld that brace and stuff, it will be cool. This is where a good old fashioned hammer and dolly come into play. Now don't make the mistake of using too much force. The sheet metal was stamped in the shape and has a memory. You're just reminding it where it's supposed to be. Now sometimes I'll use a rubber mallet because it doesn't stretch the metal like a steel hammer does. There we go. See how that's coming out now? It's looking beautiful. I can see it's still inched a little bit. So I'm gonna take one more whack. So I can sight this one right down, that other one. Since I'm looking at this, and that's almost the same radius as that, I'm gonna use this tip on the inside and whack the snot out of it. Get my body line back in. Right here we got a high spot where this got hit and it pushed that metal up and created a, a high point. So you got to work that down, but you can't just hit it or else you move the whole area back down. So you need to get a dolly, put the dolly on the back side of it to support the low area and then hit the high spot. And as you move that down, that low spot will actually walk back up. Just like that. Beautiful. With the taillight opening back to its former glory, the rest of the trunk can go in. With the help of some Clecos and plug welds, it all comes together easy as pie. Bring it up some more. Up. Uh, right there. Time to custom make some more parts that nobody repops. Cardboard and a marker can be your best friend here. 
Now from the factory, these extensions were part of the trunk floor, but the aftermarket parts don't include them, so it looks like we're on our own. But we're not done yet, and it's becoming obvious why some guys would pass up a car with this kind of problem. The two of us have spent about 15 hours using a lot of specialized tools to bring together over a dozen separate pieces just in the trunk alone. Now just like any project, you just need a game plan and take it one piece at a time. Now we got a lot of pieces and a lot of man hours into patching the rear end of this thing together. We're gonna get the rest of this trunk floor welded in. When we come back, we'll see if the deck lid still lines up. Got it? Uh-uh. Uh, look at this. <laughs> After the break, suit up. It's time to get the lead out. Now comes the moment of truth. Time to drop the deck lid now that we've got everything welded together and see how far off our body lines are. It's rough. Oof, yeah it is. You know what that means. I don't need a port of power, I think. You got it. I'll go grab it. A port of power is basically a portable hydraulic ram. It comes with a pump, ram, extensions, and different feet. This one is a four ton model, but they come in other sizes too. You can use them for what we're doing here, spreading a gap, but they can also be used for straightening frame rails, pushing roof pillars, or just about anything else you need a lot of pushing power for. Ooh, you hear it cracking. Like I said earlier, metal has a memory, so you'll have to over push it and let it spring back to where you want it. Yeah, better. Not overhanging anymore, at least. Still got a ways to go. It's better to make several pushes, increasing the pressure slightly each time, than to make one big push too far. <laughs> I think it moved. Where's the hammer? Let's hit it and relieve some of the stress across here. I'll move it by another 16th or 8th of an inch. Hitting it with a hammer while it's under stress will give the metal new memory, helping it to stay in place. It's one tough car, man. Yeah, he's good more. Let's see it. We're actually pulling in the, see where it's sucking it in? We're actually pulling on the factory spot welds now. There Perfect. we go. Perfect. Hey, it's time to get the lead out. Literally, a lead filler can cause a lot of problems in your paint down the road, like blistering and bleeding. So we're gonna melt it out. But you gotta keep in mind, lead can be really dangerous stuff, so you gotta protect yourself. That means covering yourself up, wearing a respirator, and using good ventilation. A portable local exhaust system with a HEPA filter will keep the fumes from contaminating the area. Wear a suit and gloves, and don't forget to cover your feet. If a child or susceptible person comes in contact with residue left in your clothing, shoes, or body, they can get lead poisoning, which can cause brain damage. So shower and wash your clothes afterwards, and don't lick yourself clean. Well, the method is pretty simple. Use a torch to heat the lead to its melting point, then scrape it off. The more heat you apply, the more fumes are released, so use as little heat as you can to get the job done. If you have access to a flameless heat source, use it. You also need to dispose of the lead properly. Place it in a six mil bag and take it to your local hazardous waste disposal site. And don't forget to clean the floor. With all the sheet metal work done on red sled, we can get rolling on the mud work. But before we do that, we need to get the body back on the chassis, make sure that the tire's still clear, and make sure the body mats still line up. You know, we've been pretty lucky so far with this project. But as the body drops down, <laughs> our luck runs out. Now, as any guy knows who builds cars, if you change one thing, it can have a domino effect. Case in point is the body mounts. Since we tubbed each side by an inch, our body mounts are now off by an inch. 
Now there's a few ways that you could fix this, but sometimes the best way is the easiest way. So we're just gonna drill some holes and run some bolts through them. Now don't go anywhere, because once I get this fixed, we're gonna start hanging some body panels. Coming up, Buick's Mean Modern Muscle Car. Today's flashback, a 1987 Buick GNX. All across the country, guys love racing their Buicks. And their motto? Going fast with class. Going fast with class. We headed to the GS Nationals in Bowling Green, Kentucky to find out just how fast. We have a little of everything here, but it's got to be Buick powered. That's what the Nationals is all about. One of the fastest cars on the strip is the Grand National. I like racing Grand Nationals because you can make so much power with a V6. When it comes to mean, modern muscle cars, the GN is in a class all its own. And the ultimate GN? Oh, well, that title belongs to the limited edition 87 GNX. The GNX is just a good looking, classy ride. Buick only made 547 of these bad beauties and they came in one color, black. This car right here, well, it's number 31 off the production line and it's owned by Buick lover Michael Norman. Driving a GNX is totally different than any other Grand National out there. It's got so much more torque from the bottom end up. It just really gets up and going. The GNX was only available in 1987. Buick was retiring the Grand National that year and wanted to send it off with a bang. So they partnered with ASC McLaren to produce a more powerful version and dubbed it the GNX. Lurking under that hood is the standard turbo V6 engine. But it's been enhanced with a Garrett T3 turbocharger, which has a lighter turbine wheel made of ceramic. The inlet pipe and heat shield are both coated with ceramic to dissipate heat. The turbo could produce up to 15 pounds of boost, giving this engine 276 horsepower. It's an increase of 31 horse over the standard GM. All this extra power meant it needed greater cooling capacity, so a new intercooler with more fins per row was added. The suspension also got beefed up with a rear panhard bar and ladder bar to handle all that extra torque. Buick also added larger 16 by 8 inch alloy wheels with a black mesh design. Fender flares were enlarged to handle the wider tires and louvers were added to help remove heat from the engine bay. The inside looks like a GN except for the sleek Stuart Warner analog gauges and only GNX's had a special plaque embossed with a production number fitted above the glove box door. Another way to spot a true GNX is to check out the vehicle emission tag under the hood. Instead of saying General Motors, it should say ASC Inc. It may surprise you, but the GNX was the fastest production car in 1987. It even beat out the Corvette. It was a true sleeper car back in the day. Thanks to its incredible performance, power and limited edition status, the GNX is a highly sought after and very collectible car. But that's not stopping Michael from having a little fun. If I want to have a car, I'd rather get out and drive it. If I can't drive it, I'd rather have a picture on the wall. Welcome back. We got our body mounts taken care of and we're ready to start hanging some body panels. Now considering all the cut and chopping we've done on red sled, the problems that we've run into have been pretty minor. But to avoid any problems in the future, we're going to hang all of our sheet metal, set our gaps, and then we'll finish our body work. Let's go up with it a little because the body line right here is down, that one is to kick it up and slide it back a little bit. The core support needs to go on before we can hang the fenders. This used one showed up just in time. We'll get it blasted and primed it later, but it'll do just like it is for mock-up. 
I gotta put a shim in. Now back in the day, even the factory used shims, and we're no different. If you're in the right spot, and the driver's side's looking nice. Oh, this side ain't looking so good. Hey Brent, give me a hand for a second. That mountain there is a mile away from the Exactly, pole too. the mountain's like an inch off. So what do you think, pull the fender off and try to bend that, bend that corner down? I can bend that back. Let me see what that bracket looks like on the other side. Whoever took this fender off the donor car bent it, is what happened. Hey, it's it's rolled up bad. Is it? Yeah, this side, it's like, like kicked straight out. Yeah, dude, you're right. This side here is all bent up. Oh. That whole thing's bent up, probably good quarter inch. Do you want to try bending that bracket down? Let's snatch uh, your fender off. Yeah. <laughs> dude. It's not moving. You need a bar. You need something to put. Deep thoughts. All right, you hold that end down. Let's see if I can get this end tweaked. There it goes. Yeah. It's going your way now. Oh, there it goes. Wanna try it back on there? I gotta move it to stand. And sometimes the TV stuff can get in the way of the car stuff. And sometimes TV stuff, it gets in the way of snack time. <laughs> <laughs> but through sheer determination, we forge on. Does it line up the hole? Dude, we are the best panel liner uppers ever. <laughs> Perfect, that's it right there. Cool. Our original hinges were tweaked and we're still trying to find another set. That's all right, we don't need the hood to open and close, we just need it in place to set our gaps. So we're gonna drop it in and keep rolling on our bodywork. Now keep tuning in, because Red Sled's still got a lot of hours left in the shop. But for now, we're out of here. <laughs>